Welcome to the Good Life Agora Hills podcast. Join us each month as we discuss important city projects, programs, and initiatives with the community. We appreciate your support and thank you for tuning in. Romero, what's up? What's oh. going on? Hey, Julia. Um, hey. I'm just writing a letter to our good friend, Joe. Joe? Yeah, we, we have a common acquaintance. Joe? Joey B? The Bidenator. Oh, the President of the United States! Listen, Julia, if you don't mind, when you get back to the White House, if you could drop this off, I'd appreciate it. You bet I will. Thank you so much. Hey, and don't forget, agorahillspodcast.com. You ready to do this? Got it. Yeah. Let's go. Let's do it. Hello, Agora Hills, and welcome to another episode of your favorite podcast, The Good Life, Agora Hills. I'm Ramiro Adeva, your assistant city manager and the proud host of the show. <laughs> we are so fortunate today to have our special guest. She has done so much remarkable work from the West Coast to the East Coast to, I like to think, coming back to the West Coast to really hang out with you and I today to do this podcast. But in all seriousness, we are so fortunate to have her join us today. So I'm just going to bring her out. She is the leader of our 26th Congressional District for the state of California, the one, the only, Congresswoman Julia Brownlee. Come on, make some noise. <laughs> Julia, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you. Best introduction I've ever had. I'll go wherever you want me to go. Perfect. All right. So listen, Julia, I want to first start off with, with a little trivia for you. Because, uh, you know, we actually have some, some ties at the, at the federal level. You're obviously there, uh, you know, as a member of Congress. But Agora Hills is kind of on the map over there as well. I'm not sure if you know this, but uh, Vice President Harris's husband, yes. the first second gentleman, yes. right, Doug Emhoff, is actually a proud graduate of Agora High School. I know that. Did and you know that? Actually, I was just with him last week, and it was the first time I'd had the opportunity to tell him that Agora Hills was part of my new district, and he's like, I know. See he that? knew that. Shout out to the Agora Chargers, yeah. and shout out to Mr. Emhoff. We would like to start off first by getting an idea of who you are, Julie, as a person. Obviously, you've got this long career of being a public servant, and we greatly appreciate it, and we're so excited to be working with you in the future. But every journey has a story. And so we want to start there. If we can get maybe a glimpse of your story, maybe what you did prior to getting into politics, and maybe what ultimately drove you to pursuing elected office. If we could start there, that'd be great. I went to college uh, in Washington, D.C. I went to George Washington University um, and uh, loved being in Washington. I grew up in Southern Virginia. Um, I make that distinction because Northern Virginia surrounds Washington, D.C., but Southern Virginia is an entirely different place. Um, but that's where I grew up. And so when I went to college in Washington, D.C., I was going to the big city. Um, went to GW University, and I was a political science major. I was an intern on Capitol Hill, and this was a long time ago, <laughs> but I was an intern uh, on Capitol Hill. I will say that, you know, I was always very interested in politics. It was very exciting to be uh, on Capitol Hill as an intern. Um, you know, Shirley Chisholm, I mean, th these, you know, just historic figures uh, serving at the time. So it was very, very exciting to me. I never thought in my wildest dreams that I would ever hold political office, ever, ever, ever. I did graduate from GW as a political science major. Then I went on to American University and got a master's in business administration uh, in the marketing area. And I worked for a couple of big Fortune 500 companies doing um, marketing for them. And, um, you know, enjoyed that. And actually, probably that background and experience has paid off for me um, uh, as a member of Congress and in political office. I raised my kids um, in Santa Monica, got married, moved to Santa Monica, raised my kids uh, in Santa Monica. And it was my daughter when she was in third grade, she's my oldest, very proud of her. She uh, does humanitarian work. She lives in Cambodia. She and her husband right now did. They, she just had a baby, so I'm a new grandmother. Uh, she speaks three languages. She's amazing. 
Um, but when she was in third grade, she wasn't reading. And as a, I was a completely panicked parent. Um, and so advocating to the school district that she needed some services to help her along in all of this process. And so it was that advocacy uh, and going through that advocacy that I thought, you know, this should be easier than it is. And I just started to think about it. And I said, you know, I think I might run for the school board because I'm a believer that what I had to go through to get her services, every parent shouldn't have to go through. And I started to think about parents that had language barriers and other yeah. kinds of things and how difficult that might be. So I ran for school board and uh, served on a school board for 12 years. I loved really every minute of it. Um, and then there was this opportunity where Fran Pavley was terming out of the state mm -hmm. legislature and uh, there was an opportunity for me to run, and Fran and Sheila Kuehl both encouraged me uh, to run for the seat, uh, of which I did, and uh, by a miracle, I won and served in the state legislature. I chaired the education committee when I was there, um, and uh, then there was this opportunity to run for Congress, and here I am. All right, well, we're happy. That, that's great, and thank you for sharing that personal touch. And that's a power set of women right there that you mentioned. Fran Pavley, obviously our first mayor of Agoura Hills as well, so shout out to Fran. And I, and I, you know, I, I have a personal appreciation for your Cambodian reference. My wife is Cambodian. Oh, very so, good. So that's, she'll, she'll love Excellent. hearing this. Excellent. Yeah, well, my daughter was in Africa for six years prior to that doing work, and so they're now in Cambodia, and they feel like they've arrived in Phnom Penh and New York City, right. you know, all the comforts of home. It's a beautiful place. I've been there. Absolutely. It's, it's really wonderful. Oh, that's great. Okay, so we're going to get into redistricting. Um, you know, and, and I think part of the beauty of that intro was to really, we wanted to get to know you because this, uh, for the most part, this is an introduction to our community. Agora Hills prior to January was in a different district and now post January we're in your district. So redistricting, just a quick background to provide some context. Every 10 years, right, we have the U.S. Census and there's all these, the, the population count, trying to figure out where people are, where they're moving to. And then ultimately that kind of boils down to then re-looking at the district boundaries and making sure that there's adequate representation for the people, right, in, an, in a nutshell. Um, and so following that process, Agora Hills is redistricted and we're put into, into your district and here we are. Being that we are with you now, what excites you about the new boundaries of the district? And you know, obviously having your new favorite city, Agora Hills. And then <laughs> uh, how do you balance the varying needs of the different cities within your district? Well, um, I am so excited to represent Agora Hills. Um, I, as I mentioned before, I had the opportunity to represent Agora Hills in my six years in the state legislature. Uh, it's an amazing, forward-thinking, dynamic uh, city leading the region in so many different ways, and very, very excited to be to have the opportunity. I feel like, in some sense, I'm coming home. So it's it's really, really wonderful. Um, and in terms of um, you know representation of the cities that I represent in, in the 26th district, I mean I look at every single city uh, it, within the district under the same lens. Uh, you know my job is to represent everyone within this district, and I'm going to work very very hard um, to represent Agora Hills um, to my very very best ability. And there are a lot of exciting things going on in this city, and I am truly truly honored to be a part of it and to continue your progress. All right, let me ask you this question because. We, I mean, we know that you have a proven track record of being a very dedicated representative for your constituents. I will tell you that at the end of 2022, when we were going through this redistricting process, there were some concerns raised by community members about um, going into a district that is no longer connected to the Santa Monica Mountains. Obviously, Agora Hills, we carry the moniker of being the gateway to the Santa Monica Mountains, and you know, you can look at all the advocacy work that our council has done through the years to really promote and support a lot of the open space preservation efforts that have happened. But for the person that has those concerns about being separated from the Santa Monica Mountains, uh, what would be your take on why that should not be a big concern? 
Well, again, going back to my state legislature days, I represented Santa Monica Mountains, so I've been you know, very invo involved. I mentioned to you that I raised my uh, family in Santa Monica. Um, so Santa Monica Mountains has been really part of my livelihood uh, you know, since I have lived uh, in California. So, um, and of course, I've had the mentorship of Fran Pavley, um, of Sheila Kuehl, um, of Louise Rishoff, who worked for me for six years, a council member, former mayor right. here as well. Um, so I've been pretty well indoctrinated uh, into the Santa Monica Mountains. And one of the reasons why I was so excited about representing Agora Hills again was to be part of um, the governance around uh, Santa Monica Mountains. Uh, let me ask you this. So Agora Hills, now we're in your district, and when you look at the boundaries of your district, you can see that a lot geographically, uh, many of the cities, and I'd say probably the bulk of your cities, are within Ventura County. Mm -hmm. And there were you know, questions brought up, again, going through the redistricting process about people kind of questioning, okay, is this the best thing for Agora Hills? Because you know, a lot of the district is within Ventura County, and then you've got maybe some of the westernmost cities in Los Angeles County. Mm -hmm. For somebody that would say that, why would you say that shouldn't be a concern? Well, it should be a concern. And really, uh, you know, you talked about redistricting and, and part of the requirements around redistricting is to keep communities of interest together. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, Agoura, Calabasas, Westlake Village, part of the Conejo as a sort of a regional area is the reason why it came into the 26th district was because there was a community of interest uh, there together, but particularly between those three cities and Thousand Oaks for that matter. Um, so I, I think it, it made a lot of sense. Um, and, you know, as I said earlier, I look to representing the entire district. I look to representing every single city in the district under the same lens and um, I'm excited. Congresswoman, we're gonna shift uh, over to sustainability and climate action planning. This is something that the city of Agoura Hills is extremely prideful of. The city council just adopted a climate action and adaptation plan, uh, one of the first in probably our region here. Uh, you know, they are looking at approving a bikeway master plan, which as we know is part of Agoura Hills, one of our, the actually primary greenhouse gas emission source is from on-road transportation. Mm -hmm. and so. As soon as we can get these bikeways constructed and make it safe, then we will be promoting more of alternative modes of transport, which we think are going to be much better than you getting in your car and then releasing those gases into the atmosphere. And then, you know, they, they most recently adopted a, uh, uh, an ordinance for uh, mandating all electric construction for new, and res new residential and commercial development. So very much moving in the line of, of trying to help the sustainability efforts. We know that you are also a very big advocate of um, being environmentally um, sound and, and um, being a steward of, of preservation and, and really taking care of the environment. Can you give us a perspective on, on maybe some of those beliefs that you share uh, with that, that, are, that as they line up with the Gore Hills? Because we know that that's something that's very important to you. It is very important to me, and I, and I view climate uh, and the climate change as an existential threat um, to our planet. We need to do what Agora is doing and every single city across our country and around the world and around the globe need to be doing what Agora Hills is doing. So thank you for that. You know, when you think about the next generation and the generation after that, we have got to protect uh, the, this planet and it's going to take a whole world effort to do so. I was very delighted uh, four years ago, uh, then Speaker Nancy Pelosi appointed me to a select committee that she created on the climate crisis. And so for the last four years, I have been really, really very much involved on the federal policies in terms of what the United States is going to do uh, with regards to uh, addressing climate. And actually, the work that we did on that committee ended up being really President Biden's uh, climate platform. Um, and uh, we were able to pass, uh, in the last two years, we passed some very important pieces of legislation, um, including the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act in incorporated lowering prescription drug prices, is what, which is very important. But the most substantial piece of that bill is the largest investment 
the United States has ever made to address the climate crisis, and it is the largest investment that any country has ever made to address the climate crisis. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done um, to move towards a clean energy future, to get to net zero uh, emissions by 2050, which is the president's goal. Um, this particular bill and the resources that we put into it will get us to about 41, 42% um, of emissions reduction. So we still have a ways to go here. But the interim goal of, at 2050 is to reduce emissions by 50%. Mm -hmm. So it is a significant investment towards getting to that to getting to that point. So I think for the first time, and I've been able to, with the speaker, the last couple of years, I've gone to the United Nations environmental co uh, conferences, both in uh, Madrid and Glasgow. I went to, didn't, was not able to go to the last one in Egypt because it was the day before the election, right. and I had to be here for that. But, um, so I've had an opportunity to meet uh, many like-minded individuals around the world who are really committed to this. Um, and it's e extraordinarily rep uh, important. I really do believe that if we don't address the climate crisis, we will get to a point shortly where much will be irreversible, that we can't, we can't get it back to where it should be. So we have got to, we have got to be committed uh, to this objective. Yeah, and we, we couldn't agree with you more. Uh, and, and I'm glad you mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act because I think, you know, uh, inflation in general, you know, obviously people are feeling the, the rising costs and they feel like their wages are just not increasing at the same rate that the cost of goods is increasing. But I think a, a big part of them, I'm glad you touched on it, is, is that other component that the Inflation Reduction Act doesn't just address what we feel as far as inflation, but there's that climate component as well that's a big piece of that bill. So yeah. thank you for going into that. Yeah, and I, and I do believe that uh, the Inflation Reduction Act it's, is an act that is not going to address inflation tomorrow. Right. I mean, it does lowering uh, prescription drug prices. It's a right. big deal uh, to American families, without, without a doubt. But in the long run, in the longer midterm and longer run, it is a very, very important bill with regards to inflation and getting off of our dependency on fossil fuels. Critically important Absolutely. in the long term. Sticking along the lines of sustainability, we, the city of Agoury Hills, uh, we submitted a couple of funding requests to your office uh, earlier this month. The first one being the bikeway plan. We talked about, you know, the, that if we can go ahead and, and start to construct some of these bikeways throughout the major arterials in our city, that would be a really good thing. And then also we put together a, uh, a request for uh, a microgrid to be installed at the Agora Hills Civic Center. Uh, that, that operates as our emergency operations center and whatnot, and so that would be big. But from a funding perspective, for those folks that don't know, there is a process. And if you could maybe just touch on how that funding process works and what your mindset is like going into this process where you get so many project requests. If you could do that, that'd be great. Sure, well, we're right in the middle of that process right. uh, as we speak. Uh, this is a process that has only been happening for the last two years. Um, so we've been, I believe, very successful. Um, last year, we were able to award 14 different projects to the tune of about $20 million. The projects that Agora Hills has submitted are very exciting uh, projects. They certainly fit into uh, certainly my line of thinking and the issues around sustainability that you mentioned again, being part of the uh, climate action plan with bicycle paths is really important. We will go through the process. We're working very closely now with your city manager and just had a meeting with your city manager and mayor just before uh, this interview and we're working closely with you and, you know, fingers crossed, we're in a different um, leadership position uh, in Congress this year, or at least in the House of Representatives. So. Um, we don't have the same kind of predictability that we had over the last two years, um, but I'm hopeful that um, I can be and my office can be helpful in these projects. Great, and we look forward to having those discussions with you, so thank you. All right, so emergency disaster recovery assistance. Um, as you know, uh, CAL FIRE has designated the city of Agor Hills in what's known as a very high fire hazard severity zone. And that does create uh, a lot of concern, some anxiety for our community, um, obviously. And, 
and sort of the lasting impacts of the Woolsey fire from back in 2018 still haunts us today. I mean, it was you know such a devastating wildfire that came through here and, and obviously uh, created a lot of, of uh, destruction. So uh, in light of that, we also know that in this light, you're a very involved representative when it comes to listening to your constituents about the concerns they have about emergency recovery or assistance that they need. Could you describe your level of involvement at the federal level in assisting your constituents with these kinds of concerns? Because for us, it's really not a matter of if the next one's going to happen, but, but when. Absolutely. Well, I have to tell you that, uh, you know, in my 10 years in Congress, I now feel somewhat an expert uh, and uh, federal disasters and FEMA, um, just because uh, early on um, in my tenure was the Thomas fire. Um, and uh, I was very involved with that at the command center every single day for 10 days. I, I, and of course the fire went on longer than 10 days, but I, we were in session back in, in Washington and I wasn't there, I was here. Um, and trying to be as helpful as possible to um, the folks that were impacted uh, by the Thomas fire. And then, as you mentioned, the Woolsey fire. Um, I wasn't in, my home was not impacted in the Thomas fire, but I was live in Westlake Village. I was impacted and had to be evacuated um, in the Woolsey fire. So I had a firsthand sense of what families go through. I feel like I can pick up the phone with Cal OES or pick up the phone with FEMA. Uh, I'm, I've got their numbers on my cell phone uh, because I've been in touch with them so many different times through so many different disasters. Agora Hills, I believe, is doing what they need to be doing in terms of building resiliency and so forth in, in their planning and moving forward. And that's what we've got to do. We have got to do this. And a microgrid is important to that, to that piece. But bottom line, going back to facing the climate crisis, this is why it needs to be addressed. Um, look at this. I mean, this is the most beautiful, picturesque, it doesn't get prettier than this. And we want it to stay this way at all times. We have to be really, really vigilant um, on doing everything that we possibly can to protect ourselves uh, for the next event, because you're right, there is gonna be a next event. So let's talk veterans. So now you serve on the Veterans Affairs Committee. I do. And, um, and honestly, you should be commended for all the remarkable work that you've done to ensure you know, the improvements and the better lives of the veterans across this country. So thank you so much, first of all, for, for that. Um, we in Agora Hills, we are very respectful, very grateful for all the men and women that have served in our armed forces. And we have a, a actually we have a good population of folks here in town that are veterans yeah. as well. Um, speaking about the work that you've done, could you highlight maybe some of the things that uh, you know, your feelings on, you know, the, some of the efforts that you've worked on or are working on to continue to better the lives of our veterans. And then also maybe give uh, a little highlight on how resources can be made available to veterans if they have questions and would like to contact anybody about them. Sure, absolutely. I'll start with your last question yes. first because it's an important one um, for any veteran who is having any kind of trouble finding barriers towards getting the benefits that they have earned and deserved, please call my office. Uh, we work very, very hard at making sure veterans in this area do get those benefits um, that, they, as I said, that they have earned and deserved. In our office, in terms of for veteran services, for social security benefits, taxes that need to be returned, whatever the issue might be. At this point, we've, we've returned $30 million to individuals across the district. And probably, you know, a great preponderance of that is around veteran, uh, of, around veteran be benefits. So I want veterans to know they can contact our office. And, you know, I've been on the Veteran Affairs Committee for 10 years uh, in Washington. I come from a military family. Um, it is an honor for me to serve the veterans here uh, in my district, it's an honor to serve our nation's veterans. And I've done a lot, and I've had a lot of bills signed, and I've gone to the White House many times to, for bill signings and the like. 
I think my proudest really accomplishment of recent is uh, trying to bring parity to our women veterans. Women, uh, women are the largest growing cohort within the veteran community, and the disparity in terms of healthcare services is, has been quite wide. Um, and so I established a Women's Veterans Task Force back in Washington and went across the country talking to women veterans, actually talking to women in the military and women veterans, talking to women in the military to understand what their needs are coming out. Um, but to tr I traveled across the country and, and spoke with all of these women um, who have served our country, who are serving our country, or have served our country, um, and got a sense of what we really needed to put together in terms of legislation moving forward. And we put together a pretty comprehensive bill. We called it, we called it the Deborah Sampson Bill, and we called it Deborah Sampson because Deborah Sampson uh, was a woman uh, who disguised herself uh, as a man and fought in the Revolutionary War. Um, and after she fought, in the, she was actually injured uh, uh, in battle, but afterwards she really was advocating for benefits for veterans, not for women veterans at the time, but just for benefits for veterans, that they, you know, they, they're putting their lives on the line our country owes them something when they come home to, to help them and to support them. So it was nice, it was, I was really proud to be able to, to name this comprehensive bill um, to bring better services and more parity uh, to our women veterans. And that's been an ongoing, it's been an ongoing project for me. So I am currently now sort of working on Deborah Sampson part two um, and trying to continue that work. Um, and there's a lot that needs, uh, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And part of it is just cultural, changing the culture within the VA. I was happy that just yesterday, the secretary of the VA announced, which I have been hammering from the first day that uh, I became a member of the Veteran Affairs uh, Committee, is to change the motto of the VA, which was uh, a quote from uh, Lincoln for he who borne the battle. Um, and that just doesn't apply anymore um, because there is no she in that. Um, and so he's now just changed the motto to be much more inclusive. Um, and, but it, you know, I feel like it took a long time, but it's important because that plaque will be on every VA facility across the country so that women, when women walk into a VA facility, they don't feel, they feel part of the men and women who served our country. Yes, I love that. And I actually have a question. I'm, I'm, we're gonna get back to that because that, that's such a remarkable thing. Biggest focus is going right now. What are you most passionate about working on? And what are some of the hopeful outcomes that Agora Hills residents should look forward to as you continue to represent us in the 118th Congress? Well, I love that question. Um, I think, you know, f going into the 118th Congress and, and beyond, um, but particularly these next two years, my biggest focus is to make sure that we implement what we have accomplished. And we accomplished a lot in the 117th Congress. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, we talked about the Inflation Reduction Act, the Chips and Science Bill to begin to um, build resiliency in our supply chain by building microchips here in the United States. 90% of our microchips come from Taiwan. Those are big pieces. Um, um, and we need to make sure that we that everything gets implemented. And we talked a lot about the largest investment our country has ever made in terms of the climate crisis. We need to make sure that that those resources don't disappear. Um, we're in a in a Congress right now with different leadership, with different priorities, um, and we've got to hang on to that and make sure that that bill is fully implemented, implemented, and all those resources. Um, are available. Same with the infrastructure bill and, and um, the CHIPS bill as well, but I think when we talk about the climate, when we talk about infrastructure, I think these are two things that Agora Hills will be able to benefit from in the long run because there are going to be resources there for you in terms of infrastructure, there'll be resources there in terms of pursuing your climate action plan. Absolutely. Exciting times ahead. Yes. Exciting times ahead. 
All right, so look, we know that this relationship is a two-way street. You do an amazing job as we've you know, been watching you from afar and now we get to work directly with you, but you do an amazing job representing your constituents. The other part to that equation is us. So this question is more of what can Agora Hills do to better assist this partnership and making sure that it's extremely successful moving forward? Well, I think, you know, the answer to that is pretty simple, and that is talk to me, you know. We just need to continue to be in communication and, and partnership. Um, for the best way for me to represent Agora and its residents is to know what all of the issues are and how we can work together to solve them. That's what I hope to do and I think we already have a great partnership. I'm looking forward to strengthening that partnership and I'm looking forward to really moving forward uh, and, and, and making Agora the greatest city it can be. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going to go back. I'm going to close with this question. So this one's near and dear to my heart. I have an 11-year-old daughter um, who I'm constantly talking to about being able to achieve anything that she puts her mind to, that don't let any no's be in your vocabulary. You can do anything. Whether you know this or not, you are an inspiration for young ladies all across, that next generation of leaders that aspire to do great things for our country, for their communities, um, so for my daughter and for other young ladies out there that are aspiring to be that next generation of leaders that are going to take our nation to greater heights than we could have ever imagined, what would be your words of advice to, to keep them moving towards knocking down barriers and not letting anything stand in their way? Well, I think just what you've told your daughter, really, is don't let anything stand in your way. To have your dreams, fulfill your dreams, work towards that. Um, and, you know, to try my very best to inspire them to move into leadership roles. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, in, in office like I am, but in leadership roles wherever their interests lies. Um, I am a firm, firm believer that the more women who are involved and more women who are in leadership roles will certainly make for a better country moving forward. I am absolutely convinced. Uh, and we need more women in Congress. We need more women. We're, you know, we're, we have a vice president now who is a woman. We almost had a woman president. Um, and that time is coming. Uh, your daughter is in a prime position. Maybe she will be president one day, but she is in that that position where so many before her have broken down those barriers. I'm not saying that when she comes of age, those barriers, some barriers won't be there, but we will continue to fight and the more women that are in leadership today will help to bring those barriers down and to make our country the very best that it can be. They understand, we understand families, we understand struggles, we understand. Um, and as a consequence, we, we know what kind of policies need to go forward. Um, and particularly policies that need to go forward to equalize the playing field. I mean, we're still working on equal pay and other kinds of things. Um, but we gotta keep working at it. And the more that women are in leadership roles, the closer we get to all of those goals. So listen, there you go, Agori Hills, straight from the Congresswoman. I want to thank you personally for joining us again here today for, again, your favorite podcast. I want to thank all the amazing crew that has set this all up for us, Julia. Yeah. And last but not least, can't say enough to our amazing guest, the, the incomparable Congresswoman Julia Brownlee. So thank oh. you so much for taking the time thank to be you. with us here today. And, you know, you got to come back anytime you want. I will be Deal? here. I will be here. Thank you here. so much, Julia. Thank so, you. You know how we do it on this podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Until we see you next time, keep living the good life. In Agora Hills. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. <laughs> I really it's great. Thank you. Catch up on previous episodes at agorahillspodcast.com and hit that like button and subscribe to The Good Life, Agora Hills.